we went to the top of their list. But what we were being targeted for destruction, we were also being imbued with these waves of affirmation that surged through the black power movement. And we were inspired and being so inspired and so enthusiastic brought more and more people into the movement. We were becoming revolutionaries, men and women. We were learning to fight the undocumented war that was swirling through our streets. That's Kathleen Cleaver, and this is Alternative Radio. I'm David Barsamian. This edition of AR features Kathleen Cleaver on state repression of the Black Panthers. Of all the radical organizations in the 1960s, none struck as much fear in the establishment as the Black Panther Party. Militant blacks off the plantation system of subordination was just too much for the white power structure. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover called the Panthers the greatest threat to the internal security of the United States. The official apparatus of repression, federal and local, launched a systematic campaign to sabotage, undermine, and crush the Black Panthers. And they were successful. Agent provocateurs, disinformation, and straight-out assassination, as in the case of the murder of Chicago Panther leader Fred Hampton, were part and parcel of the methods used. Today, the state again has accrued extraordinary powers of repression. There are lessons to be drawn from the experience of the Panthers and the current situation. To talk about these issues is Kathleen Cleaver. She dropped out of college to work full-time with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in 1966. From 1967 to 1971, she was the communications director of the Black Panther Party and the first woman member of its central committee. After sharing years of exile with her former husband, the late Eldridge Cleaver, she returned to the United States in 1975. She received her law degree from Yale. She's on the faculty of Emory University in Atlanta, where she teaches law. She writes about and is an advocate for human rights. Kathleen Cleaver spoke at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in late 2006. The topic of this uh, series, the 1960s, 1960s, uh, is that something that still makes you take up, stand up and notice? Do you still notice the 60s? So why? Why do we still read about the fashions and the music and the cultural and political movements of that time? But in fact, what we call the 60s are waves of social upheaval that um, actually began in the 50s and sort of crested in the 70s and had some sequels into the 80s. But that's what we talk about when we say the 60s. So when I say the 60s, it's not the time, but it's the mood, it's the energy. And it was a time when those people in power viewed with horror I mean, they want to bury it. They want to forget about it. They wish it never happened. And they keep trying to be cynical and nasty and make all these little uh, references, uh, shoot little shots as to how that, you know, is behind us back then. As Franz Fanon, who is the Caribbean psychiatrist who became part of the Algerian National Liberation Movement, wrote in his work, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, he said, every generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it, was something that we identified. We identified with his diagnosis. So a fundamental theme of that experience was expressed and implemented in both the political and cultural work, which I think you cannot separate. Uh, there were times when they were separated, but it's acknowledged that they, the political work is cultural work, and the cultural work is actually political work. That theme is connecting. We wanted to connect to each other. We wanted to connect to our communities in the project of liberation. We wanted to connect to those freedom fighters around the world who inspired us and who were inspired by us. So you can also talk about this making connection as unity, which was one of the overriding aspirations of the black power movement, black unity. We were convinced that power for oppressed people lay in unity. And one of our overriding aspirations is what we called self-determination. And another was what we called solidarity. 
In the Black Panther Party, the 10-point platform and program's first point was, platform and program's first point was, we want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our own black community, which is a very, very clear statement of self-determination, which is the opposite. Self-determination is the opposite of what we called a colonized dependence or a historically imposed powerlessness that was our experience. So in the work of expanding social justice and political freedom among oppressed black communities, we joined and we started and we expanded numerous campaigns and movements to put an end to police brutality, economic discrimination and exploitation. We wanted to radically enhance the opportunities for education, to have access to better neighborhoods, better medical care, and particularly to put an end to the abusive treatment blacks were receiving in courts and in prisons. So our goals of expanding social justice had both a domestic and an international aspect. So when it came to those movements in Asia and Africa and Latin America for liberation or national independence or socialism in places such as Cuba or Mexico or Angola or Mozambique or Guinea and most particularly in Vietnam, what we exhibited was solidarity. That means we share those commitments. We support the goals of those struggles, which we could appreciate because of the fight that we faced at home against the ruling powers. We saw ourselves in the belly of the beast. We were fighting an imperialist situation. We saw imperialism domestically, imperialism internationally. So the Vietnamese who were fighting against the U.S. Army, we saw as fighting against the same power that was exploiting and oppressing us. And it's not just we who saw that, they saw it. It was very clear. Vietnamese sent delegations here. We have conferences and meetings in Montreal and France and other places where they would talk to us about what, how they saw our movement and what we could do to support them. There was a support expressed for the black freedom struggle, uh, and particularly the day of August 17, 1965, the anniversary of that day, and that was the date on which the Watts uprising or the Watts riots, you probably heard it called riots, we called them insurrections and rebellions. When um, that started in the section of Los Angeles called Watts, uh, it was picked by OSPA, the Organization of Solidarity with the People of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, based in Havana, as the day of solidarity with African, Afro-American people. Now the call for black power as an explicit statement in a political context, and I don't mean just the use of the words, because the words are there. They've been mentioned in many different contexts, but the call as an explicit statement in a political context arose during June of 1966 in a march across Mississippi, articulated during a speech Stokely Carmichael made at a rally in Greenwood, Mississippi. Now later he wrote a book with uh, Charles Hamilton, the political scientist, and he explained that black power call for, quote, a reorientation of the values which dominated the middle class white world, values which he admitted the civil rights movement had not deeply questioned. If anything, he wrote, it has accepted those values and institutions without fully realizing their racist nature. Reorientation means an emphasis on the dignity of man, not on the sanctity of property. It means the creation of a society where human misery and poverty are repugnant to that society, not an indication of laziness or a lack of initiative. The creation of new values means the establishment of a society, and he borrowed this, he said, from John O'Killen's book, Black Man's Burden, based on free people, not free enterprise. And he concludes that to do this means to modernize, indeed to civilize this country. So there were clusters of activists, particularly in urban areas where legalized segregation was not the primary obstacle the community faced. It was mobilized around the radicalism of this concept of black power because it crystallized the impatience we shared and our repudiation of the values and culture of white supremacy. We all knew through the experiences of either our families or our ancestors or of our community or from what we learned in history about forced submissiveness, forced impoverishment, forced political silence that blacks had experienced. And we shared a rage against all those elements of terror and violence and power 
that were keeping us in a state of war, that were keeping us in a state of mental slavery. I was among them, and at the time I was a college sophomore in New York City when I heard the black power, which to me, I listened to, I heard it in the context of liberation movements and independence struggles of that time. I heard it as a call for self-determination and also as a call for solidarity among ourselves. Uh, that September, Stokely published uh, in the New York Review of Books an essay, What We Want. It became a very famous, many, many times reprint. How many of you have ever seen this essay, What We Want? Okay, a very small number. This is a scholarly text now. But at the time, it was in popular distribution to explain his ideas because when you have a movement that is calling for freedom now and black and white together and we shall overcome and we're all brothers and then you start talking about black power, there, needed, there was a call for an explanation. What does it mean? What does it mean? Of course, uh, the interpretation most uh, immediately available was that it means violence. It means racism. It was a very negative interpretation given by the media. So Stokely publishes this article and one of the, one of the lines that really struck me uh, I mean, it just completely turned me around when I read it. He said, integration, first he said, black power uh, deals with poverty, and integration only deals with color. But then he said, integration is just a subterfuge for white supremacy, which is not a claim that many people in the civil rights era were making. Black power, he said, is a call to recognize the values of our distinct heritage, to define the goals of our own community, to lead our own organizations, and to reject the racist values and in institutions of the larger society. So I saw that, and I just knew it was this collective process of transformation. This is what it's a call to, for us collectively to make fundamental changes, not to be integrated, as I was at that point, and I was a student at uh, Barnard, integrate into white universities, those of us who were fortunate enough to be there, being integrated, we were being prepared to pursue the course of individual advancement, private aggrandizement. So Stokely wrote that integration was despicable because it teaches you that you need to move to a white neighborhood to have a good house, and you need to attend a white school to have a good education. And he said that disintegration for us is disintegration. One of the reasons I was so responsive to what he was saying and what he was explaining was because my, my earliest years in Tuskegee, Alabama, where my father was on the faculty of Tuskegee Institute, uh, the black college started by the famed, the legendary Booker T. Washington. It was sort of an oasis of security and culture in the midst of the direst, poverty-stricken black belt counties of the Deep South where sharecroppers lived in tin roof shacks with dirt floors, and their children who had to leave school in and out to go pick cotton and do other things received only the most rudimentary education or health care. And those families who could afford that sent their children away from Tuskegee to go to schools like in Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or wherever so they could actually get uh, solid education. So my parents had met as graduate students at the University of Michigan and they had been active in the civil rights struggles of the 1930s. My father was part of the uh, effort to desegregate the all-white primary in Texas, and my mother had been involved in something called Southern Negro Youth Congress that protested school segregation and other forms of uh, racial discrimination. So I was in a community that was active, and I was in a family that was active. And by the mid-1950s, my father had left Tuskegee Institute, become part of the early foreign service programs in the third world, uh, working in India and the Philippines with rural farmers that, like he'd done in Alabama. So as a child, I had a look at countries that were run by brown-skinned people who had won their independence from British or American colonial powers. I lived in New Delhi. I lived in Manila. And it was obvious to me that self-government and self-determination could be achieved at the claims of White supremacy, the people of color were incapable of self-government, was totally bogus. So when I came back to the U.S. and was in high school, 
I saw civil rights demonstrators in the Deep South. I saw them in Alabama. I saw them in Georgia. At least I read about them or heard about them, saw them on TV, who went out and confronted terrorism and brutality to register blacks to vote. When the protest demonstrations were swirling around Birmingham, the ones with the police dogs and the fire hoses that Bull Connor made famous all over the world, that was the that was the summer I graduated from high school, 1963. And when I went to college that fall, that was when the four girls were killed in 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. So like millions of people of that generation, I was primed by the world that I was living in and by how my family and community were responding it to find a way to join the struggle to put an end to segregation and injustice. As far as I was concerned, that's all that really mattered. That was the most important thing I could do. And for me, black power opened that door. So I moved to the national headquarters of SNCC in 19, early 1967. I worked in a uh, group called the Campus Program um, and SNCC at that point was in a state of crisis because its financial base was predominantly white and liberal and they were not that thrilled about the new black power direction and so the finances were crumbling. In fact, on paper, we were given $10 a week. That was our pay, but we didn't get any pay. And so I told my father, who was paying my tuition then, which was something like and it tells you how long ago it was. I think it was something like $800 a semester at a private school. Um, I told him that he should give me the money, and I would go to Atlanta, and I would get a better education than I was ever getting at Barnard. And so he agreed. For, he said, you do it for a year. Um, so that's how I was able to work in the movement, and I was able to uh, pay rent and support my little collective of SNCC workers who none of us, we were, on paper we got $10 a week, but we in fact got nothing. So I was working in Atlanta, and we were organizing a conference that was called, I think, the conference was going to be held in Nashville at Fisk. It was called Liberation Will Come From a Black Thing. So this is the very early days of black consciousness, black awareness. Uh, we invited all kinds of black thinkers like Leroy Jones, who is now a Mary Baraka. We invited Margaret Walker. We invited uh, Charles Hamilton. We invited all kinds of people, but it was a um, blizzard on the East Coast, and none of them got there except Eldridge Cleaver because he came from San Francisco. They didn't have a blizzard, so he was the only speaker who actually came to our conference. And... For him, it was love at first sight. Um, and so he kept, leave, he wouldn't leave. He wouldn't leave. The, the conference was just a weekend. He kept finding reasons to stay and stay and help me. I was supposed to be organizing a fundraising party for Stokely Carmichael. And guess what? Before the conference started, the university told us we could have the rooms. They were granted through um, a student organization that was a support group for SNCC. But the white campus... Uh, Vanderbilt was also having a program the following weekend or the two weekends later and their program was called Impact and their speakers were Strom Thurmond, Martin Luther King, Allen Ginsberg and Stokely Carmichael and the state legislature of Tennessee was so appalled that Stokely Carmichael was coming the, this man that they said means violence Stokely Carmichael was coming the, this man that they said means violence black power, violence if we have Stokely Carmichael we're going to have violence so they tried to get impact I mean they tried to get Vanderbilt to call the conference off but they refused it's a private school they don't have to respond to the state legislature but Fisk was a black school they decided they'd just cancel it anyway no one asked them but SNCC was Snoke Carmichael was the chair of SNCC, so they canceled our rooms, and we ended up having a conference in a church near the campus. And so everything had took place in one room, and we had one speaker who was Eldridge Cleaver. Now, um, it was in a very exciting time, an exciting movement, uh, and Stokely had been in the Bay Area earlier. He had met the Black Panthers. Eldridge was actually covertly, not openly, covertly a member of the Black Panthers because of his status as being a person recently re released from prison and out on parole. But Stokely had been so excited by what he saw in the Bay Area, he 
said, they've done it. They've done it. They, they've created an organization that's an implementation of black power. It was a cadre organization. It was an urban organization. This is a small group of young men and women in Oakland who were very consciously focused on black power and also very consciously identifying with that movement. Now, Stokely Carmichael and other members of uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee had collaborated on an organization in Lowndes County, which is also very near Macon County. It's a bordering county. It's near Selma. It's near Montgomery. But Lowndes County was like 90% like black, had never, ever had an elected official in its history. Um, and they had created a Lowndes County Freedom Organization to run can candidates for elected office because after the uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party experience in attempting to participate in the Democratic Party uh, and not having much success, the, the next model was, well, let's create our own party. Their organization had a logo, and that logo was a panther. And the Democratic Party had a logo, and their logo was a rooster. And the rooster had a ribbon around it, and it said, uh, white supremacy for the right. And the black, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization logo was a panther, and their slogan was, the black panther's going to eat up the white rooster. <laughs> so um, in Oakland, uh, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, who were students, Bobby was in, at Merritt, and by this time, Huey Newton was at, um, I think it was at Golden Gate Law School, was a night student. They had created this idea for an organization. And they had a 10-point platform and program, and they had a concern about how student groups were just too, uh, they just weren't in the streets. They weren't dealing with the real issues in the community. So they're trying to find a way to organize something that would actually deal with what was happening to the community. But they didn't have a name, and they happened to find a pamphlet of John Hewlett, who was running for sheriff in Lowndes County, and they saw this um, organization, they saw this logo, and they were, the press called the organization the Black Panther Party because of the logo. So they saw this pamphlet and they said, well, that's what we want. We, we, wanna, we want Black Panther, we want to be Black Panthers, but we're not running a campaign for elected office. So they called it the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. So I want you to understand how these, in this black power movement, these organizations were participating in the same Response. They were responding to the same things, identifying with much of the same ideas all over the country in different ways. There were lots of organizations that were called the Black Panther Party. In Chicago, for example, there were three. Three groups started and called themselves the Black Panther Party. But Bobby Rush, who was the chairman of one of them, he was the defense minister of one of them, he said, I had the presence of mind to put a telephone in our office. So when Bobby Seale came through Chicago, he could meet him, to, and we are the Chicago Black Panthers, and here's our phone number. So there's this enthusiastic response around the country to do something, do something, and the Black Panther Party provided a model, and it was a different concept in different places. The way you hear about, if you hear at all, about the Black Panthers tends to be sort of a monolithic group. There they are, the Panthers. Actually, we, our conference in, in uh, Fisk was in 1967 in March, and then we had a summer program in, uh, at, Tougaloo, at Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi that July. And when that was over, I went out to California and visited Eldridge Cleaver, and that's when I first met uh, members of the Black Panther Party. But then I came back to Atlanta in August to finish up the work I was doing, and before uh, I had finished, the Black Panther Party radically changed because its leader, Huey Newton, was uh, arrested in a shooting incident, charged with murder. Uh, a group of other members had gone to jail for visiting the state capitol uh, in protest of a... They were protesting a bill called the Panther Bill that wanted to disarm the Black Panthers. And they said, we had the right to bear weapons. The Second Amendment the Constitution provides that. But they were arrested for... Uh, I believe it was uh, disruption and trespass. And for so those of you who don't know, the incident was actually, if, if it wasn't so serious, it might be funny. No one in the Black Panther Party had ever been to the state capitol. So there's a gallery where you observe the proceedings, and then there's the floor of the state capitol where the, the uh, representatives actually sit and discuss what they're doing. And so this phalanx of about 22 men and women some of whom had on black leather jackets, but all of whom had weapons that were loaded, 
marched into the state capitol and asked a um, cameraman or newsman where could they go and observe the deliberations. And he was so shocked. <laughs> Just right there. And he told them to go, and they walked right in on the floor of the state capitol. And it was pandemonium that erupted. So the, so the, the word went out that the Black Panthers had invaded the state capitol. And um, there were some who were in jail for that. And um, when I got to the Bay Area back again from Atlanta, there were about a handful of five or six people in an apartment. They didn't have an office anymore. They didn't have a newspaper. It was kind of a, a former, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense had been an organization to kind of sort of in a, in a low period. And so I saw this movement generate and explode around the country. And what I wanted you to understand, there was actually clusters of organizations in different places with different people and had somewhat different cultures. There were Black Panthers in Chicago and Winston-Salem and Los Angeles and San Diego and New Bedford and Boston and you name the city. Uh, and they had distinct qualities, but they all were linked to the same central committee, the same newspaper, and the same basic principles. And I think there's some ways in which this organization um, could be different to others in the black power movement, but the party constituted itself as a, at this point, I mean it had several different iterations, it constituted itself as a vanguard organization. They're the vanguard, they're going to kind of go out and show people how to transform the society. But it functioned in many ways like a mass organization and there led to many kinds of conflicts. It started out with small, very disciplined, tight cadres with clear rules and then went into a much larger uh, organization that didn't have uh, clear rules. So um, there was a lot of interplay between the different leaders, Bobby Seale, Huey, Eldridge Cleaver, others coming from all around the country, lots of discussions with people in SNCC and other people. We were in the process of constituting a political response to the circumstances in which we lived. For me, being in that movement, it seemed like I was always, always running, going to rallies, going to speaking engagements, going to the airport, going to the lawyer's office when I was Black Panther Party communications secretary. I went to central committee meetings, I went to political education classes, I planned press conferences, and sometimes I'd speak at a comrade's funeral. And I saw too, too many people get arrested. I spent hours and hours and hours sitting in courtrooms. When Panthers went to trial, I visited them in prison, as many Panther women did, supporting our friends, supporting our lovers, supporting our husbands. Some of us, men and women, dropped underground. What, what does that mean? It's not a place, it means you go into a different mode of functioning where you can't be tracked. You change your identity, you change your appearance, but you're still physically here. Uh, but you don't have an address, and you go through um, roundabout ways of communicating with people. Others abandon the movement entirely after some particular tragedy. They decided that the risks were just too great because it was clear as our movement mushroomed it was clear we were being targeted for destruction. There was, in 1967, a program initiated, a secret program initiated by the FBI called COINTELPRO, and they targeted certain organizations that they considered what they call them black hate groups. These are the organizations. SCLC, which was headed up by Martin Luther King, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, RAM, Revolutionary Action Movement, which was headed up by Max Stanford. The Nation of Islam, that was headed by Elijah Muhammad. I think CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, and Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Guess what? The Black Panthers weren't even on their list in 1967. You're listening to Kathleen Cleaver on State Repression of the Black Panthers. This is AR. You can order copies of this program by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-444-1977. That's 1-800-444-1977. Nineteen seventy-seven, or you can order online on our website alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. But as the time passed and the Black Panther became such an enthusiastically, rapidly expanding organization that was armed, that was confrontational, that was 
we, no one could be persuaded not to do this, you know. Sort of like if you make up your mind that you're going to be a panther, you've already made up your mind that you just might get shot, you just might get killed. But it's more important to be part of this and to take your stand than to be safe. So uh, we went to the top of their list. Um, but what we were being targeted for destruction, we were also being imbued with these waves of affirmation that surged through the black power movement. And we were inspired, and being so inspired and so enthusiastic brought more and more people into the movement. We were becoming revolutionaries, men and women. We were learning to fight the undocumented war that was swirling through our streets. Some people now claim that the Black Panther Party in the Bay Area, the original Oakland formation, had a lot more to do with a particular riot that took place in 1966 in Hunter's Point and a killing of Matthew Johnson that happened than with whatever was going on in Mississippi or in Los Angeles. So there were multiple inspirations to create this movement and to join the movement. And like many, many others, I was... Um, at home when the police came and kicked down my door in a pre-dawn raid. My family was divided when I got stalked and I had to make hard choices like all of us in this revolutionary movement that affected the rest of my life. I'm sure you can understand that it never occurred to me back in that time when we were running and ripping and running that there would be any 40th anniversary celebration of the founding of the Black Panther Party that just happened actually uh, last month. We were um, on the edge. We started out organizing around a case of a particular leader, Huey Newton. He had to be free. The organization insisted that the reason he was in jail was because of this politics, who he was. The campaign to free Huey was called Free Huey Movement, which I was very much involved in, kind of became the launching pad for what became the Black Panther Party. Not the Black Panther Party for self-defense, but a larger, more national organization. It exploded across the country, particularly in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968, because so many people said, well, that's the end of nonviolence because King was a prince of peace. King called for nonviolence, called for love, called for human rights, called for justice. And what was done to him made it pretty clear that uh, self-defense was required. And by the end of 1969, despite these fierce images that you see of Panthers all over, more than half the Panthers were women. It's not something you hear. Well, there's a lot of things you don't hear. Women's liberation was in the air back then, vociferously promoted mostly by white radical women, or radical white women in radical movements that were alienated by the sexist leadership of the anti-war movements and other organizations. Now, in the radical black movements, like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Black Panthers, women took on very heavy responsibilities unlike some what we would call more traditionalist nationalist groups like the uh, Muslim groups or the, what we call cultural nationalist groups that had this idea about women in Africa and how they had to you know, stand behind each second and all, a lot of other ridiculous things. Uh, we were those who wanted a collaborative, flexible relationship with men, so we steered clear of those organizations. So I can't really discuss them with any uh, insight. But I think because of how we interacted and because of the openness and the organization, you get an organization, you make it yourselves. That's what we were doing. This was revolution self-taught. We instilled more fairness and respect for ourselves and our leadership within the Black Panther Party than in many other organizations. And that is in face of and despite the resistance from many men. In fact, in 1970, after Newton was released from prison on an appeal, his, he was convicted not of murder in this uh, case of shooting John Fry. He was convicted of voluntary manslaughter, which had a, not a death penalty. It was a 15-year sentence. But in 1970, his conviction was in September of 1968. In August of 1970, he was released on appeal. And in 1970, <laughs> He issued a statement in the name of the Black Panther Party supporting the liberation of women and gay liberation. 
uh, which very few people ever discuss. Uh, the most thing I hear in these days are, weren't you sexist? Weren't the women oppressed? Weren't they this? Weren't they that? Of course, the whole society is misogynist and sexist. But the particular organization we were part of took some very concrete steps. I would say that the skills and the knowledge that I gained, and when I say this, I'm sure that others would say the same thing. When I was in this uh, very, very intense and dramatic movement, those skills and that knowledge is what I've been able to use to refashion my life from then until the time I graduated from law school. The things that I research and write about now uh, in African American studies and in law are rooted in that education I gained in the Black Panther movement, and I know it inspires all of the others and what they're doing. But the writer Tony Cade Bambara explained that we were also fighting over the truth. What is the truth about human potential? And she says, and that led us to discover that the truth works. It releases the spirit and it's a joyous thing because we thought, we believed that we were on to the truth and the truth is that human justice Human rights are more important and, or equally important than property rights. We had strong spirits, we had brave hearts, and we were tossed into an ongoing race war. When I say ongoing, I mean throughout history. I don't mean uh, something that just started in the wake of the Vietnam War. But one thing you do need to understand, when the society, this country, goes to war, when there is a war, and in my life, I can't think of any time when there hasn't been. I mean, I was born in 1945. The Cold War was in play, the Korean War, the war in Vietnam, these are little, little mini wars, uh, invasions in Guatemala, invasions here. So this, oh, this, this is a country that seems to be economically and politically based on a war economy. Uh, so what's going on in Iraq, this is not distinct. I mean, it's a horrendous, a horrendous, exercise, but it's connected to many, many, many other wars. And so when I say the race war, I meant the way in which blacks were being uh, abused and excluded. In large places like Chicago and Los Angeles and small places like New Haven and Sacramento, and we stood up and challenged this racist power structure, and we paid a price. Some people went to jail. Some people got killed. Many, many, many people were traumatized and wounded. Their families were disrupted. One young lady, Crystal Hayes, is doing a dissertation on the experiences of the children of Panthers, one, which she is one. And she says, although I don't think it's everyone's experience, she said the children were left behind. That's true in some cases. If your father, like her father, was arrested uh, when she was three years old and taken to jail, and he's still there. Uh, and her mother, you know, struggling to ra raise kids, and uh, she ends up being handed off. So there, there's a high price. There's a high price for uh, engaging in the struggle for liberation, which we knew. And you have to understand, when I'm talking about women fighting liberation movements in the early 60s and the late 60s, this is a time when there weren't any women judges. There weren't any women bus drivers. There weren't any women construction workers or women news. There was a few newspaper editors, but it was a very well-kept secret. Discrimination in professional schools uh, was rampant. Women were driven out of PhD programs if they even had the nerve to go in uh, because that wasn't considered feminine. But we kept on our freedom struggle, even though we had a mini, sco mini skirts, high boots, and big earrings. It was a black and beautiful days, and a pulsed with what I would like to say is a sensuous, intuitive energy. Because we became something, we were the women who became something that you don't have a category for. Black, urban, warrior women. We were sassy, we were bold, we were teachers, we were healers, but we never gave up on our dream of being women. We taught men what we expected of them. They taught us how to be stronger, how to be more clever. So in spite of ourselves, in spite of our youth, we were torchbearers for freedom fighting side by side with men. Now that's not something that you're, that you're taught about. 
fact, you're going to be taught that that doesn't even happen, that that can't happen. And the Black Panther Party had a tremendous impact domestically, but also internationally in two ways. One way is that it um, established an international office in North Africa, and it was organizing a tremendous amount of what we call solidarity committees all over Europe and other parts. We had groups who were support networks for the Black Panthers, particularly the, in Germany, France, uh, Sweden, Denmark, and England. But also, it created a model of fighting against domestic racial violence and injustice. And that model, I mean, don't think this is the only country that suffers from racial injustice and violence. And that was a model that was appropriated in some very interesting places, including Bermuda, including Barbados, including Australia. There was a Black Panther Party in Israel, started by Moroccan Jewish immigrants, and they wanted they wanted something that was really, really intimidating and frightening. So they were looking for a really good name. And they took the name the Black Panthers. And I've seen their T-shirts. It's in Hebrew letters, the Black Panthers. There was also one in India that was called the Dalit Panthers for the untouchables. So this is an organization that not only spread around the country and inspired people, but spread around the world and inspired people. Now, that doesn't just happen. You can imagine that that kind of impact was something that had to be dismantled, had to be destroyed, had to be uh, demonized. Uh, the word I would say is they used a lot of techniques, one of which is disinformation. You know what disinformation means? That means they put out stories that aren't true. You read an article in the paper, it looks like it's news, but it's not. It's a story concocted by some reporter sympathetic to the FBI or the CIA. There was tremendous amount of intelligence agencies who had programs to disrupt, discredit, and destroy us. And I'll just name some of the agencies that had these programs. The FBI was pretty well known. There was the CIA that had a COINTEL pro operation and infiltration and tried to get rid of us. There was the Department of Defense, the National Security Agency, and probably uh, intelligence operations that we don't know not to mention every single urban police department had its own red squad or black squad or hate squad, some of the most vicious being the Los Angeles Police Department, LAPD, which created SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics, created the SWAT team specifically to attack the Central Avenue, South Central Avenue headquarters of the Black Panther Party, which they did. The movement for black power was not only inspiring the Black Panther Party, but it was inspiring other t kinds of responses. There's a whole spectrum of responses. We were talking about revolutionary nationalism, smurving the people, smashing capitalism. But we have uh, our president at that time, Nixon, talking about black power is black capitalism. Uh, a lot of people like that a lot better than what we were doing. They're not the same people. I mean, you don't have the same people wanting black power for revolutionary purposes as wanting it for black capitalist purposes. But so there's in between. You have all these movements, congresses, electoral campaigns, and effort to participate in legitimate politics. And then you have the various and sundry caucuses that are formed throughout the society. If there's an American Association of Political Scientists, then they'll have a black caucus in it, or else they'll have a national society of black political. So there's the, the, not fragmentation, that's why I want to say, sort of the blossoming of black conscious elements within most of the institutions of the society. And I would say there was both a moderate and an assimilationist and even a revolutionary aspect to black power, which makes it con confusing, makes it very confusing. There were a lot of black GIs that were part of this movement, and there were even black prisoners. There were prisoners who created Black Panther parties within Angola prison in Louisiana, which is a pretty notorious prison. In fact, one of them is still there, 33 years in prison. We have Black Panthers that are still in prison. 
34 years, 35 years, 36 years, brothers in um, Nebraska, uh, Ed Ponjexter and um, David Rice, who I happened to, in doing some research, happened to come across a letter that Eldridge Cleaver wrote when he was in Algiers, authorizing them to start a Black Panther chapter in the prison. Uh, there's a young man, well, he's not young anymore. His name is Eddie Conway. He was in the Black Panther Party in Baltimore. He was also a veteran. He was also working for the post office. And he was walking down the street in his neighborhood in Baltimore and was picked up by the police and accused of being part of a shooting incident that had happened a few days earlier. Now, he wasn't part of it, but he, they wanted to get him off the streets. And in those days, if you're a Black Panther and you're accused of shooting a police, uh, you probably get convicted, whether or not you did it. He's still in prison. Um, his, one of his co-defendants has passed away. Uh, but he's working on a proposal to bring uh, new investigations of the counterintelligence program that threw people like him in prison. Because what we are involved in now is during the 70s, there were a huge number of very, very controversial, repressive legislative proposals to get rid of this movement that I'm talking about. Some of things were passed, some things weren't. There was an atrocious Senate bill, I think it was called Senate Bill 1, there was tremendous mobilization against because it was considered a blueprint for fascism. Well, um, we do have now, thanks to John Ashcroft and the entire Congress of the United States, the USA Patriot Act. Now, I don't know if you know exactly what that means, uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. That's USA Patriot. Uh, and it was passed, it's, the bill is about, the act is about that thick, it's about 300 and some pages, because it's not just a statement of what is authorized, it's a statement of how all these various and sundry laws have been changed or modified, and they're modified in ways that from the 70s to the 90s, Congress had repudiated. You can't do that, you can't do this, you can't, but under the threat of the 9-11 terrorist attack, it could do anything. And so the, many of the things that we found illegal, controversial, unconstitutional that the government did to us, it's okay now. And in fact, you have to understand this. Under the Homeland Security Act, it authorizes a fight against terrorism. Now, what do you think terrorism is? If you had to say what terrorism is, what do you think it is? Anybody? What is terrorism? Terrorism. Pardon? No, but what is an act of terrorism? I mean, if you just had to guess, what do you think is an act of terrorism? An act that opposes the United States government. What else? What kind of acts? If I say that the Ku Klux Klan are terrorists, what do they do? Extremely violent acts. They destroy people's lives. They lynch. They shoot. They bomb, right? Well, under the Homeland Security Act, act of terror is anything that's against the law. Therefore, there are people who were in prison, who went to prison for whatever crime they committed, let's say accessory to murder, that's against the law, who are up for parole. No, no, you can't be up for parole because you're a terrorist. You've been reclassified as a terrorist. There's a former Black Panther named Asada Shakur who broke out of prison and escaped to the United States in, in 79, I believe. She escaped. And she's been living in Cuba for over 20 years as a political um, refugee, political exile. She has asylum from the government of Cuba because they claim her trial. She was accused of shooting a policeman and also killing a Black Panther in an incident that happened in 1973. She's been convicted of murder, okay? But she is presently put on the domestic terrorist list because that act that she was convicted of, whether or not the conviction was appropriate, allows her to be placed on a domestic terrorist list. And therefore, the state of New Jersey can, the state of New Jersey can obtain special additional anti-terror funds and they have put a million dollar bounty on her head. And they want to bring her back. I mean, somehow, I don't think a terrorist is a person who's hiding in Cuba and trying to stay out of the United States. But 
um, that's not the point. It's a political context in which the funds, and this is what I want you to understand, that the funds that have been generated by Congress to fight terror and terrorism are being used by the FBI and something called the Joint Terrorist Task Force to perpetuate the goals against the very same people that they were fighting against in the 70s. And I'm not making this up. There are people who are in their 60s who have former police, not former police, they were San Francisco police now deputized by the FBI coming knocking on their door. These are the same people who tortured them in 1973. And they say, hi, John, remember me? Dragging them into the grand jury hearings to testify, which they refused to testify, about an incident that happened in 1971. There are cases being brought against people who were in the Weather Underground, people who were in the American Indian Movement, people who were in the Young Lords or the Puerto Rican Independence Movement, and people who were in the Black Panthers, active now, either being investigated, being harassed. So that was then, but this is now, and they're using the war on terror to... Uh, continue the goals they had then. You know, Louisiana Governor Huey P. Long once said, if fascism comes to America, you know the statement? It won't be called fascism. It will be called patriotism. So what I think is very different now is that your generation and the generation before you somehow or other seems very cynical. Not all of you because there's a huge amount of human rights organizing, anti-globalism work, recognition that the concerns of homelessness and poverty and poor medical care demand mobilization on the grassroots level and the political level. But as terms of the larger society and their counter, countering, you know, they're trying to undo the, what they, scholars like to call the second reconstruction, undo all those legislative and social changes that were generated during the 60s and 70s. We confronted a country at war with racial violence rampant and poverty rampant in a state of shock and horror and said, it's, we have to do something. We cannot live, we cannot allow these conditions to remain. And so many of you just say, well, you know, the government's corrupt, you know, might as well just go on about my business. It's the difference between those who are compelled to bring about justice and those who don't feel any need to challenge what's there. And you know, the government loves you. They just think that's great. Don't even vote. Don't even think about it. Stay home. Watch TV. The Kerner report that came out in response to the urban unrest, I think it was the uh, President's Commission on Understanding Civil Disorder, they had a series of recommendations, and one of their recommendations said that the <clears throat> uprisings, all the riots and rebellions that were happening were not caused by any little group. They were caused by white racism. But then they don't make any recommendation to do anything about racism. They make a recommendation to improve their police intelligence, that we need better information, we need this. And so I think what you find in the liberal democratic order is still an effort to use police measures and repressive measures to control and undermine the struggle for social justice and human rights. So what I think the compelling concern is now is to how do we mobilize, how do we agitate, how do we establish the movements or reestablish or recontinue these movements for human rights, which is a concern goes beyond civil rights, goes beyond black power, it's across the world, and link those struggles so that we can leave a world in which human rights have the respect, have the protection, have the recognition of property rights. I heard Ossie Davis give a talk, uh, it was about the responsibility of the artist as an advocate, and he said, so you've spent 500 years in the struggle for freedom. Take the next 500 years and fight for equality. Thank you. That was Kathleen Cleaver on state repression of the Black Panthers. 
She spoke at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in late 2006. Kathleen Cleaver was the Communications Secretary of the Black Panther Party and the first woman member of its Central Committee. Today she teaches law at Emory University in Atlanta. This program is produced by AR, an unembedded award-winning weekly series based in Boulder, Colorado. AR is independent. Our sole source of financial support comes directly from listeners just like you. AR features such voices as Bobby Seal, Stokely Carmichael, Russell Means, John Pilger, Angela Davis, Tariq Ali, and Howard Zinn. To access our vast audio catalog and to find out about subscribing to AR so you don't miss a single program, go to our website, alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. To place a credit card order for a CD, MP3, or written transcript of the program you just heard, Kathleen Cleaver on State Repression of the Black Panthers, call us toll-free at one 800 444 one nine seven seven. That's one eight hundred four 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 nineteen seventy seven. Or you can order on our secure website alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. Ed Russell recorded the program. Series theme music is performed by the Kronos Quartet from Pieces of Africa. Ali Lightfoot is our editor. I'm David Barsamyan. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.